So okay. we've got, well, I'm trying to think of where to start. You want me to just like kind of go over this? So base, okay, so this is what I think I know. I'm okay. getting like, okay, so the sacroplasmic reticulum, huh? calcium, right? right. And then um, what's what the blue, light blue that surrounds those, um, those are the T tubes, yes. right? Yes. And, that's, um, and that would um, penetrate to the cells, um, like the A band and the I band. Yep, the sarcomere. Yep. Okay. Oh, I get so excited. Okay. Oh, it's so it's you. You got it. So basically, the so the T tubules are where the the electro uh, chemical signal comes down. So I go. I keep going back to this one. So that signal comes down the end of that axon and reaches the uh, the muscle fibers, and so each muscle fiber gets its own little um, uh, neurotransmitter uh, axon terminal um, that's like talking to it. And when okay. that axon terminal, when that signal reaches the end of that axon terminal, it basically, um, that electrochemical signal goes throughout the sarcolemma, which is the, um, basically the plasma membrane of muscle cells. So uh -huh. uh, the, um, so like the, so the plasma membrane of the muscle cell and the plasma membrane transmits that signal and since the T tubules are uh, continuous with the plasma membrane, that signal ends up going down those T tubules, which are the light blue ones, like you said. Okay. So once that signal goes down into the T tubules, uh, the T tubules dive down in between all of these myofibrils to get to all the different sarcomeres on them. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, um, it tells all of this uh, SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. To release calcium into okay. the myofibril, yeah, and that's that's when we're doing um, um, when it releases the calcium. That's when our muscles are contracting, right? Yeah. So once that calcium reaches uh, each sarcomere, it binds to the find my find the good picture. Oh. That's why I had this. So here's that neurotransmitter, that signal reaching the sarcolemma, which then goes to the T tubules and gets inside everywhere. So the calcium, once it's released from the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is also like in here, right? Because this is the muscle cell. So the sarcoplasmic mm -hmm. reticulum is actually surrounding all of these little guys. Once mm -hmm. the sarcoplasmic reticulum um, releases its calcium, oh, here we go. Those thin filaments, remember, which are yeah. actin surrounded by tropomyosin, which is Proteins. blocking the, acting, the action sites, yeah. And the troponin, which is uh, bound to the tropomyosin, that when the calcium comes in, it mm -hmm. binds the troponin, and then the troponin pulls the tropomyosin away from the binding sites. And that's when the myosin heads of the thick filaments combined. So let me... Yeah, should I find my little kind of see on this one? So the the blue fibers are the actin filaments with the troponin and the tropomyosin. So when yeah, calcium yeah. floods in here, they bind to the little troponin blobs on these little thin blue filaments, which moves the tropomyosin away from the binding sites so that the heads, so that these little myosin heads can bind to the actin. And then just like that weird video. Let me see how I'm here. Just like that weird, the weird video that I showed you that's linked on Canvas, these little myosin heads then like walk along the actin and pull it along. So it only can happen if calcium is pulling those uh, tropomyosin uh, filaments away from the binding sites on actin. Because no, normally when there's no calcium, the tropomyosin is blocking the, action, the, um, the binding sites. And mm -hmm. so the myosin of the thick filaments it just sits there because it has nothing, it can't bind to it, it's being blocked. Okay. So the calcium comes in, binds to the troponin, which is the little blobs, and then the troponin changes shape. It's basically, it's an enzyme, right? So it's a protein that does a thing. And what it does is it binds calcium and then changes shape. And when it changes shape, it pulls the tropomyosin, which is the little spaghetti fibers, out of the way so that the myosin heads on the thick filament here can bind and then it walks.
Okay. Does that make sense? Let me review this in my head. I just want to make sure I get it. Okay. Where'd it go? Okay. Okay. Also the video too, but. Okay. Go so, for it. So um, the tropomyosin. Uh-huh. So um, that's the long one, right? Yep. That's the, like the spaghetti. Oh, oh that's, that's a, it's actually blocking the binding sites. Yeah. Okay. So, so the stringy filament thing. Okay. There we go. Okay. So when that is just, um, when there's no calcium, no, um, um, can I say is no um oh my god I'm going blank like action potential oh yeah like there's no action okay so when it's just hanging out there um it's obviously not doing nothing the myosin heads are just chilling because they're not binding because there's no calcium so when the calcium hits that's when the trouble myosin um ends up like you know opening in a sense. It just gets pulled out of the way. So these little these little blue blobs, the little troponin guys, when that changes shape, when this enzyme changes shape, for whatever reason, because it's also attached to the tropomyosin, it changes shape in a way that it pulls that strand away from those binding sites. Okay. And then from there, that's when they'll connect to the myosin heads, and that's when they will do... And they start walking. Okay. <laughs> exactly. And then you said um, when when we do like like move, do I say like movements like contracting uh, yeah, actions muscle Action. actions yeah okay so when we do like a um, just want to make sure I got this so when we do contractions or we get contractions that's when the H and um, the I you know get closer right yes and we are not doing anything with no movement that's when they're long right and that's when they and then the medium the m doesn't move it's mm -hmm. just there mm -hmm. um, h does the does the h it, one is one of the ones that shrinks like you just you just said that yeah yeah okay and then okay the and little thin filaments are moving in because okay. these little guys are are pulling them in like this Right. Oh, that makes sense. So that's when that they connect with okay. so from here to here. It's it appears this little lighter band. This whole thing is the H. This little H zone. Mm -hmm. It appears to get smaller because where it's really dark right here, that's where the thick and the thin filaments are overlapping. So there's just like a lot of density of these filaments happening here. Mm -hmm. So this zone, when it's relaxed looks big because you've got all this room in between this end of this thin filament and the end of this fil fil thin filament and then when it's contract like contracted down here basically it's these little blue thin filaments that have been pulled all the way in towards the m line okay. and then basically like all looks uh dark so that okay. that h zone basically like gets goes down to nothing pretty much here. Like they, they, together, they, yeah. they don't even label it on this one because it's so it's so far gone. <laughs> but you can see that the little the little thin filaments, the blue guys, are now like right up against each other at the M line. Okay. They were far, far apart when it was relaxed. Right? Okay. So basically these thick filaments have pulled them all the way as close as they can get to each other. Perfect. Okay. And then the C's, um, the Z's, basically that's in the corner of all the um, sacro, sac, um, yeah, each sarcomere has sacromere, sacromere right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have okay. two Z discs. Then I guess, I mean, they, so they share the neighboring sarcomeres share a Z disc. Um, but you can see by the Z disc here and here compared to a contracted muscle, that they do go in, they do go in slightly. So the sarcomere as a whole gets smart, it gets smaller. It pulls in closer. Cause you've got the Z disc here and the Z disc here. In a relaxed muscle versus in a contracted muscle, they've moved in a little bit, like from here to there. Okay. Do you see that? Sense, yeah. So the um that word. I feel like it just throws me off. This oh, um, sarcomere. Anything that's like sarco is muscle related. So you have the sarcolemma, you have the sarcoplasm. 
Uh, mm -hmm. You have sarcomeres, sarcoplasmic reticulum. <laughs> the one that is sarco, it's S A R C O, so it's sarco. Yeah, that I'm. I'm talking about the one with the C. The one with that. Um, if you go to that one slide I was showing you. Oh right, oh, this one. The last word, centurnia. Centurnia. Oh, the cisternae. Cisternae. Yeah, it's so silly. Yeah. So basically, like a cistern is like a like a barrel or a tank or something that's that stores a liquid, like in actual practical real life. A cistern is basically just a container to hold something. Um, so that's just the word that they chose for the um, that part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum where that calcium is being stored. Okay, nothing so to say. Okay, these little so it's basically just the parts that are like up against the T tubule. Mm -hmm. The T tubule is where that signal is going to come down, right? So as it's coming down here, it's it's activating um, like ion gated channels so basically as the as that signal comes down it's basically like a it's an it's an electrical signal so it's a it's a different in charge between one side of the membrane and the other side of the membrane so it's almost like a, it's like a domino effect so like as the signal comes down it alters that gradient that electrical gradient uh, from either side of the membrane that is like the tube that is the t-tubule um, and then as, as that difference in charge comes up a next comes up next to these cisterns, we are cisternae, which is the mm -hmm. technical plural way of saying it, um, right up next to the T tubule, it activates some of those little um, those little gates, kind of like like little proteins that open a gate in between the inside and the outside of the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum that these cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and that's what lets the calcium flood out so it's actually like a um, an electrical gradient that causes those gates to be activated and opened okay yeah that's the that's the background detail you don't even know that much detail but that's the background if it helps you to make more sense of it i'm the same way i have to know like how exactly is this working um, so that's, I mean, that's still pretty basic, <laughs> but that's basically how it works. Okay, and then um, just to review one part. Um, so the, epi um, I'm gonna have to really like practice on these words. Um, the epi yeah, sing a song or something. Epicium, the epicium? epicium? Oh, the epimysium, yes. That one, okay. So that covers the outside of the muscle, right? Yep. So I know that, okay, covers part of the muscle. Yep. Well, the outer side of the muscle. Yep. Um, the perisium, perisium, the paramecium. So the so the 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 root word mycium or mesium muscle. I S. Yeah, that's also a muscle thing. So sarco and and myco and myso. Um, so think of it as as just adding epi or peri or endo. Okay. Out of that word. So that one covers the bundles of the muscle fibers, right? The epi is the outermost. No, the peri. The peri is the fascicles, covers the fascicles, okay. which is basically a bundle of muscle fibers. Okay. I don't know why there is, I guess the only reason why there's that, that delineation is because you have that, um, because you have that connective tissue sheath around these. So like, and when they're grouped like this, it must have to do with like, the certain like once the nerve reaches the muscle like obviously it branches off to reach other parts but maybe it's like it branches a certain amount to go to the fascicles and then branches more to go within the fascicles to each mm -hmm. muscle fiber so i'm not sure why that's the delineation like why fascicles matter like why it is okay. muscle down to muscle fiber i'm not sure why there's this step here obviously there's a good reason i just don't know what it is um, okay, um, so that one, and then the um, endomysium covers the smaller fibers, so muscle fibers is covered by the endosium, right? Endosium, yep. Okay. The yep. muscles are made of fascicles, right? Yeah, so a bunch of muscle fibers, each one with endomysium around it, and the endomysium is outside of the, um, the sarcolemma, right, which is that the plasma membrane, because this muscle fiber right here, 
that's a muscle cell. Mm -hmm. That's an actual muscle cell. So it has its own plasma membrane, just like all other cells. But the endomesium uh, is just, it's connective tissue that's in between all of them. So it's basically like this lighter colored stuff right here. That's just connective tissue in between the muscle fibers. And we call it endomesium. Oh, okay. The paramecium is basically like these larger white areas. Around, like, so like this is a fascicle right here. Mm -hmm. So this is the this would be the paramecium surrounding that. Um, yeah, and then the epimecium surrounds the entire muscle, and it culminates in the tendons at the end too. So it like kind of like ends in a tendon. Okay. The end of the muscle. Yeah. And I think that's um. What other? Can I see the last slides? I think just to sum it up for my own self. Oh, uh, um, for this one or for the other, for what we did today? For this one. So I think that's about it, right? That's all we, I really need to know. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. So basically you go, you go from one nerve feeding one muscle and that nerve branches off to um, basically interact with every single muscle fiber, which is the same thing as a muscle cell. Okay. At each muscle cell, you have, you get down to one axon of one neuron, like, a nerve is a bundle of neurons, right? A bundle of axons. So when you branch it and branch it and branch it and branch it, eventually you get down to that last one neuron with its one axon, which talks to one muscle cell. And that uh, action potential, electrochemical signal, um, comes down the axon to the uh, axon terminal, uh, and it jumps that neuromuscular junction and then that's the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane of a muscle cell, uh, basically takes that signal and it like spreads across the entire sarcolemma, the entire surface of the cell. And at the same time, it dives in down into the, tu the T-tubules, which are continuous with the sarcolemma. And those T-tubules go right up next to these terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And as that signal is going by, it opens these gated channels in the SR, sarcoplasmic reticulum, which um, basically lets the calcium escape uh, down into uh, and in between every single myofibril to reach every single sarcomere. And then from there, the calcium binds to troponin. <laughs> which uh, changes shape and pulls the tropomyosin away from these little binding sites on the actin. And once the uh, binding sites become available, the myosin heads of the thick filament latch on and start walking. And when they do that, they pull the thin filament in towards the M line of the sarcomere, which in turn makes the H zone get smaller as those thin filaments here and here come closer to each other because the myosin is pulling them. And the sarcomere in its entirely also gets smaller. So the Z, the Z discs get closer to each other. Um, also, the I bands get smaller as well because you had this gap here in between the end of the thick filament and the Z disc. But as the thick filament pulls those thin filaments in towards the center, this gap gets smaller as well, right? So that I band is also going to get smaller. So the I band, the H zone, and the sarcomere as a whole those are the three things that actually get smaller during muscle contraction. Everything else stays the same size. So the A band uh, is just where those thick filaments are. And the thick filaments aren't actually like, they're not actually moving, they're just pulling. They just stay where they are and just pull. So that A band doesn't actually change size. You can see like from here to here and even where they measured it, like here to here. That's the same size. And the M line is just a line, so it doesn't change. And the Z discs, while they get closer to each other, they're just lines too, so they don't actually change. Okay. 
And uh, once that muscle contraction uh, is, has done its job, then those calcium ions are going to be sucked back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, those cisternae, uh, the cisterns to store it. So the calcium goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, those binding sites on the actin get, uh, get recovered. So the calcium leaves, the troponin changes shape back into its resting shape, and the tropomyosin gets shifted back over the binding sites, blocking them from the myosin heads of the thick filament. So the myosin heads can't attach anymore, and the, um, the sarcomere relaxes, and you have a relaxed muscle. Perfect. It all makes sense. It's really cool. It's really yeah. neat. Like it's, it's, it, 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 oh, I want to explain it so that you get that moment, because it's really actually quite fascinating. And I want to share that with you guys. So I'm glad that it yeah. makes sense. I'm glad that it Yeah, makes. it does. I'm like, okay, it totally it just, it makes sense. The whole process. It totally, it actually makes sense. <laughs> I, for, I, love, I love muscle physiology. I feel like it's just really, it's really cool that way. It's like, oh, okay, I can totally see that. It's really weird and like complex how it has evolved to work that way. Um, but it's kind of cool. And pretty amazing that it happens one like so fast I just can't my mind can't wrap around the fact that you can send a signal from your brain to your muscle and it's it's conscious and it's voluntary but it happens so fast that you're not having to actively think about it um, I know. it's amazing that all of this can happen in that microsecond um, so that we can move in real time but this is again that uh, that cool animation video and I do have it in your guys' uh, canvas as well. So it's over here in week week 12, I guess. Let's see. Oh, this is why I'm freaking out. What the hell is this crap? So it's got, uh, I made such a mistake trying to upload our Wiley Plus into our canvas. That was like such a, should not have done that. <laughs> it's a lot, yeah. It's all, it's just it's and it's all useless. I need to like go back and unpublish it so you guys can't aren't looking at it and it's just making everything confusing. But the animation is over here in week 12 too, so that's the link to that cool cross bridge cycle video. And what else? What okay. Else? So I think that's the cuz I'm I'm like rewatching everything. So okay, now I got that one out of the way and I it, like before I wanted like step like and I was going to tell you like I like these like recorded videos because I could always go pause you. Yes, and go back right. And <laughs> you know, until it makes sense, but this makes me happy because I am like, okay, now I got that. Now I can move forward. Yeah, I know. It's like, it kind of makes me want to, even if we did have face-to-face -face lectures, I would like to record them so you guys could have access to them. Oh my gosh. I think that would be so we Like record our phones and stuff and be like, can I record a lecture? But it's <laughs> to have it a video too, because I'm, I'm very, I like to gesticulate with my hands. So it's nice yeah, to have it in a video. I really, really do like it. So what is the second, I forgot, what's the second video that we're doing, that you did? That so, you the first, so the first one, um, oh, I, I think I know what you're asking. So basically for this section, we have, um, uh, sorry, for like for this exam, we have three videos. So we have, let's see if this is, oh, and it's, a, it's done doing whatever it was doing. So I can post the link now. But we had the uh, the, mus the muscle tissue lecture back on last Tuesday, which was chapter 10. And then on Thursday, we bas I basically split chapter 11 in half. So on Thursday, we talked about head, neck, and torso muscles. And then today, we talked about arms and legs. OK. That's and I'm going to have to just review the second video and yeah. then review today, just so I could kind of like, I don't like moving forward until it makes sense to me. and like. Yeah, because then you're just like piling, you're just piling like nonsense on top of nonsense. <laughs> I actually do enjoy it once you get like, you should have said, okay, this is my second cup of coffee. So I'm like, I'm sitting here until it makes sense to me. I don't care. Yeah, I guess is it. <laughs> we are going, we're doing this brain, like suck it up. We're doing this. Um, yeah, technically. <laughs> but so it makes me have them as lecture one and lecture two. But I should probably do like... I'll make it a little bit more specific. Arms and legs 
versus head, neck, and torso. Okay, so that one is up now. Publish that. Make it pretty. Okay. So there's our video from today. I think I will just say, I'll just say that this is head, neck, and torso, if I can learn to spell. Okay. All right. Okay, so the second one, um, I'm going to, to review it. The um, chapter 11 in general? Yeah, because I'm already done with the first one that you uploaded. Oh. And it makes this one, it's all making sense. Like, I'm good with this one. I can move forward to the next one. Let's see if I can find I didn't think yeah. I closed it. What I do with it? There it is. Yeah, this one. Okay. So. so. Let's do a recap, unless you want me to like skip any of it. No, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm for it if you have time. I'm on it. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm here, right? Okay. So uh, I make my notes. Yeah. Okay. I basically, um, I kind of picked and choosed out of chapter 11 and then at the tail end of chapter 10, some of the... Um, uh, kind of like physiology, but more of like the physics of muscle movement and the way we like talk about it. Um, and some of the stuff that's, I feel like is kind of like, um, like kinesiology kind of stuff in terms of, um, really common, um, ways that we describe like different types of muscle tissue. Um, and what they do because I feel like we like I feel like slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers like that's something that comes up if you're talking about like sports or kinesiology or like physical therapy like that kind of stuff comes up so like you're gonna want to know that stuff motor unit that's pretty basic I probably should have put that over in the chapter 10 stuff a motor unit is basically that thing that I have pictured right here like this is a motor unit. So it's this, it's this neuron, it's this axon. Um, actually, more, more accurately, it's this. So it's this neuron, the axon, and, and all of its little axon terminals that talk to each muscle fiber. So a motor, motor unit, a motor unit includes the neuron and all of the muscle fibers or muscle cells that it's talking to, basically. And you recruit motor units depending on how many you need. So if you're just doing something, um, some just moving something, then you might use fewer motor units than if you're trying to lift something really heavy. If you're trying to lift something really heavy, you know, when you're like, when you're like testing something out, like you're trying to lift like a piece of furniture or something, and you're just like, oh, let's see how heavy this is, you know? And you go down and you try and lift it, and there's that moment when you like, surpass the amount of weight that it is and actually lift it um, if you can, right? So during all of that instant, all of those moments when you are um, starting to try to lift a heavy object, your muscles are basically going like, oh, not enough, not enough, not enough, not enough, there, that's enough. So your brain is like just recruiting, sending more and more signals until you surpass that weight and are able to lift the thing. So you're recruiting motor units based on the need only. Um, so you're not using all of your all of your entire muscle to do something if you don't need to. You just use kind of the bare minimum of what's required um, to do whatever it is that you're trying to do. And then within each motor unit, um, or I guess it's probably more accurate to say that, um, so if you've got all of these like, millions of motor units in each one of your muscles, right? Um, different muscle fibers in each of your muscles. And I think there's a combination um, in most of your muscles. I think some muscles are just one type of uh, fast twitch or slow twitch fiber. Um, but I think there's a combination in most of your muscles. So you've got... Um, your slow twitch fibers. So you've got motor units that are made up mostly of slow twitch fibers and you've got motor units that are made up mostly of fast twitch fibers. 
the fast twitch fibers are going to be basically used first. So they're going to be recruited first because they have um, access to glycogen, so sugar, which um, is um, a really great form of energy, but we can only store so much in our muscle cells. There just is only so much room to store your glycogen. So you use it up really fast, but the trade-off is that you get to um, be really, really strong and really, really fast while you have that glycogen or that muscle can be really strong and really, really fast. So you use up that glycogen pretty quickly. So your fast twitch fibers fatigue really quickly. So once you use up all that glycogen, then those muscle fibers are pretty much useless until you can bring more glycogen in, which takes time, it takes a recovery period, right? The slow twitch fibers start to get recruited later on as your body realizes that you're not just doing a really fast, strong thing and then you're gonna be done. If it realizes that, oh, this is gonna go on for a while, then we better start recruiting slow twitch fibers because they are resistant to fatigue. Uh, even though they're not quite as strong or fast, they take a little bit of time to recruit which is fine because the fast twitch fibers are hard at work while you're trying to recruit those slow twitch fibers, right? So you use up your glycogen real fast, your fast twitch fibers get tired, then the slow twitch fibers by that time have been recruited and then they can um, maintain um, that stamina for much longer. And in addition, they actually look different. So the slow twitch fibers are red, they're actually red looking, and the fast twitch fibers are white looking. So it's, this is basically like red meat, uh, like in a chicken, and fast twitch fibers is where the white meat of the chicken is. Like literally, those parts are fast twitch versus slow twitch. Like the chicken breast, that's like the, um, the pectoralis major muscle. That's all fast twitch because they use their, they, fly with their wings, right? The pectoralis is used for this kind of motion. So when they're flying using their wings, they're using those fast twitch fibers. Which is white. Okay. Which is the white, the white meat, right? The white meat on the chicken is like the chicken breast. You know what, that's so funny you said that because I didn't, it's gonna sound pretty weird, but I did not know there was a difference between white meat and I mean, it actually is, right? I didn't know that. I thought I know. meat I was think, meat. I don't think most people know. The, it's just like it looks a little bit different and you think like oh it's just like in this particular bird or something but if you look at it like the breast meat is always white meat and like the drumsticks are always red meat because chickens are like constantly walking around so they can't use their fast twitch fibers because they would get tired and not be able to walk around so they use their slow twitch fibers to walk around and occasionally they might have to like fly over a bush or onto a fence or something like to get away from a predator or to get up to roost. Um, so they use the fast twitch fibers like in their breast meat to, uh, to do that, to do something really fast and strong for a minute. And the rest of the time they're using their red meat, <laughs> like their drumsticks to just like walk around, which is what they do all day. So they need to have that stamina. That is so great. You're, my mind is just like so I'm like, I know, it makes so much sense. It's great, it's great. My physiology is fantastic. So okay. regardless of what type of fiber it is, um, your muscles um, can be involved in what are called uh, isotonic contractions or isometric contractions. And all that that means is that they are either, um, they're either actively lifting or moving your body uh, completely and like actually moving around um, versus um, holding something steady or like staying still in a way that you still have to use energy and you're still like tense, you're not relaxed, but you're like in a position where you have to like hold it, you know? So the iso isotonic contractions are when the tension, when you have constant tension and the muscle actually changes length. So my example is that if you're like lifting an object or if you're, mo you're like doing a full muscle action, like if you're doing flexion of the, of the arm or the elbow, isotonic contraction means that the muscle is changing its length while the tension remains constant. So it's just like a smooth action, smooth muscle action. An isometric contraction is when the length of the muscle, the metric length of the muscle stays the same um, while tension 
um, is generated up to a certain point. So if you're like holding a position, you are creating enough tension to put your muscle where it needs to be, but not giving it any more so that you actually take it all the way. So you're basically like holding a position or you're holding an object out and just holding it there without actually like moving it. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. makes sense. Cool. So it doesn't matter whether it's like fast twitch, slow twitch, that has more to do with how many times you're going to be doing an isotonic contraction or for how long you're gonna be doing an isometric contraction. You may need to recruit more white um, or fast twitch versus red uh, slow twitch. Just depends on what, your, what combination of isotonic and isometric you're actually doing. Okay. So like when we like lean down, like when we like do a squat mm -hmm. and we it, then that will be isometric, right? Because we're holding it. So it's, it's gonna, it'll be isotonic when you're actually like, when you're, while you're moving, but then when you're holding it, then it turns into an isometric contraction. So it's Got isometric it. when the muscle stays the same length, whatever it is, but it's not changing length. Isotonic is when it's changing length. Got it. Make sense? Yes. Cool. Okay. All right, and then all of your muscles are paired, right? So you have to have at least two muscles around a joint in order to do um, like uh, the movement of that joint in both directions. One muscle group, muscle or muscle group, uh, pulls the joint in one direction and the other muscle or muscle group pulls the joint in the opposite direction. So the one that's doing the pulling is the prime mover and the one that's doing the relaxing is the antagonist. So out of that pair of muscles, um, they are the prime mover or the antagonist at different times. So they like they switch roles depending on what you're doing. So the example that I gave was the biceps brachii versus the triceps brachii. The action, the actions are flexion and extension. During flexion, the biceps brachii is the prime mover because that's the one that is working during that action, right? Which is closing the, the angle um, between these two bones in this around this joint, right? So flexion, biceps brachii is the prime mover, and the triceps brachii is the antagonist. But in uh, extension, it's reversed, right? So when you're doing extension, it's the triceps brachii that's the prime mover because it's the one that's actually pulling, and your biceps brachii has to relax, otherwise you can't do this, right? So it becomes the antagonist in extension even when you could feel it too oh yeah you can it's really cool actually if you like, like so you actually practice the different muscle actions it probably would be the best way to learn them honestly and to learn where those muscles are too because you can feel um all of these different muscle actions in all of the different muscles if you just like go down the list and do all of these things figure out what these mean and then do all of the things you can find those muscles um, so this yeah. is my biceps, brank, brank. Uh, your biceps, brachii. Yeah. And then our, my triceps. Your guns. Your guns and then, yeah, the back of the arm. And you, you can, you flex it enough, you can get that little indentation, which is the in-between two of those, um, two of the muscles of the triceps, brachii. Yeah. So I'm gonna put, okay, so. So it so, depends on what action is happening to tell you which one is gonna be the prime mover and which one's gonna be the antagonist. So when I release it like this, mm -hmm. prime mover would be my try. Yep, exactly. Okay, makes sense. Yep, whichever one is, whichever one is pulling becomes the prime mover. The antagonist is the one that has to relax in order to do the action. Oh, okay. Right? Got it. Cool. I did talk about synergists a lot. Um, in this last one, because um, um, in your arms and legs, you have a lot of synergists, which are basically just um, helper muscles for the prime mover. So most of the time, it isn't just one muscle that's doing a thing around a joint. Um, in fact, I can't think of an example when it is just one muscle, except for maybe some of your facial muscles might just have the one muscle that does a thing. Most of the time, it's a muscle group. In, um, and within that group, there will be one prime mover, and then the rest are called synergists, which is basically just helper muscles to do the action. Okay. And um, skeletal muscles, this was just kind of to help you to memorize them. They can be named according to their location. 
to their shape, uh, their relative size, of their uh, maximus, uh, medius, like the gluteus, maximus and gluteus medius. Um, I don't think we talked about any of the minimus or longus. We have a couple of longus muscles, which means that they're, they're just really long and skinny. The direction of the, uh, the fascicles, right, which corresponds mm -hmm. with the direction of the muscle fibers. Um, that uh, also plays a role. So if, it's, if the word rectus is in it, like, the, uh, like your rectus abdominis, or we have the, um, um, your quadriceps muscle on the very top of your um, upper thigh. The, um, it's eluding me, your rectus femoris because it's over your femur. Um, because those fibers are all running parallel to each other, just like you would normally think about. So it's just like a flat, straight line muscle. Versus, um, let's see, we don't have any transverses. We have some oblique, your external and internal obliques, um, your, um, basically your, your sides, like your core are your obliques. Um, those guys are running diagonal to the, um, to the midline, which is your imaginary defined axis. So the midline is for your um, external and internal obliques. And they can be named for the number of origins. So your biceps has like two heads, right? It's got like two places where it originates. So it's, that's why it's called the biceps. Triceps has three. Your quadriceps, um, I think that's, I mean, that's technically actually four separate muscles. So number of origins or, or number of, of muscles. The location of the attachments. Um, I guess like the deltoid, um, because it, uh, inserts into that deltoid tuberosity, but I don't know which, I don't know if it's like a chicken and egg situation, what the, which one is named for what. The deltoid is named for the triangle shape, so I assume that that um, bone marking is named for the deltoid itself, but um, I don't think, we don't know we have any examples of muscles that are named for the location of their attachments, but we can keep that in mind or their action. We have a lot of flexors and extensors in the lower arm and the lower leg. And those ones obviously either flex if it's a flexor or they extend if they're an extensor. Here are some examples of ways that fascicles can be arranged in a muscle. So they can be, uh, they can actually be circular like your orbicularis uh, oris and your orbicularis oculi, the round muscles around your eyes and your mouth. They can be parallel, of course. Um, uh, rectus was the other was the other example for these kinds of parallel, long, straight ones. Your sartorius muscle is also an example of a very long, straight um, muscle with parallel fascicles. They can be convergent. Your um, pectoralis major, uh, basically, all of the fascicles are arranged like in a fan that converge at a point. Um, we don't really, I don't think we have any, oh, we do. The extensor digitorium longus is something we look at where it is basically a muscle coming off of connective tissue at the side there um, on one side versus bipennate where the muscle, uh, the fascicles are coming off both sides. So it's like a feather. Fusiform muscles are um, like, um, what's the word? Like, what is the word for like muscle cell, or not muscle cells, smooth muscle cells? So there's a really interesting word they used for that. It was like sort of like a blimp shape, but pointed at both ends and fat in the middle. Or multipennate, which your deltoid is. So you've got uh, multiple uh, like feather arrangements coming and um, joining at a point. So. There's a lot of different ways that your fascicles can be arranged, but what's important is that you're, you remember that the fascicles, where those fibers are, right, the direction mm -hmm. that those fibers run, that's the direction that your muscle contracts, right? So each of those fibers gets shorter. So that's the way, that's the direction that the muscle contracts. So this one like contracts around for you to do this. This one, your sartorius contracts to pull your knee towards the midline. So you're doing a medial rotation. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep getting that wrong. It's a lateral rotation for your sartorius. So it's pulling your knee outward. Um, so that lateral rotation of your femur, your pectoralis 
major is going, it's, it's, it's fanning out uh, like in this direction, right? So when it contracts, it's pulling like this, right? Um, and of course, fusiform uh, muscles are going to shorten like this. So muscles only pull, and that's why you have to have a prime mover and an antagonist, because they have to work in pairs, because one has to pull in one direction, the other has to pull in the other direction. They never push, they only relax. Okay. All right, so getting into it with these guys, do you have any uh, um, regions that were particularly annoying for you? <laughs> Or was it all very, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't gotten to this yet, right? So. No, well, I'm just, um, I think with this, I probably, um, you just want us to study all the, the stuff again, right? Like. So these are the only ones that you, that I'm asking you to memorize. And okay. they should correspond to the stuff in the um, coloring book that I didn't cross out on the ones that I uploaded. Okay, so you will, okay. since you actually have the physical book, you mm -hmm. will want to actually go into the assignments, I'm sorry, and okay. see which ones I crossed out according to the, uh, the ones that I uploaded okay. in here. So I had I crossed them out in the, um, while I was actually like editing them. Yeah. So you'll have okay. to go in and, and look and look at each one of these to see which ones I crossed out. But it corresponds. I crossed out everything that isn't on this page, basically. Okay. Yeah. And I'll be I'll be fine with that. Okay. Yeah. Color color these in. I feel like once you get them colored in terms of like just coloring the ones that are actually that you actually need to know. Like even if you just used this and then went through these and colored the ones that you could find on here. Um, I think it would make it super clear. It'll make it look nice and clear. So do that. And then if you're really freaked out by any particular groups, the, um, the upper legs and the lower arms um, are like really the most weird and complicated. Um, and the best way, what? My husband is over there going like this. It's raining? What? It's not. That's wacky. Not here. It's he says it's raining outside. That's really weird. That's crazy, Doc. I'll have to go out there and check it out. <laughs> you can do it if you want. He says. That's awesome. We got a little bit more water from this guy. So yeah, anyway, these these um they will be they will be they're hard to find by themselves uh, in different um, images that you might find. Like you might want to look up, like just Google like human body muscles or something and see the different ways that these are depicted because obviously it's a drawing, it's an illustration. It's not going to be like perfect. And every human body is a little bit different. So it's going to look a little bit different every time. The only way that you can really know for sure where these things are is to know what's next to them. So I try to understand these muscle groups, uh, or I, so I try to assign these muscle groups um, and make sure that I have, I'm assigning all the things around them so that you can at least reference like in context where they are. And that's the other reason why I'm trying to like emphasize that like, okay, this is the one that's in the middle. This is the one that's lateral. This is the one that's medial. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like try and yeah. reference them according to um, their relationship to other muscles. Because um, if you're trying to just memorize them individually and not like in reference to where the other ones are, um, it gets, it gets, I think it's much harder, okay. much more difficult. So for your, your lower arm and your upper leg, especially, Make sure that you're like saying, okay, well, this one's right next to this one, which is right next to this one, or is deep to this one, or is superficial to this one, medial, lateral. Try to use those relationships to learn them. Okay, Not that's what I really need to do, yeah. And your buddy over here, 
this guy, do the do the quizzes. It'll suck a little bit because you guys are don't have to know all of them, right? So you'll probably be asked questions or be asked to identify muscles that you're not that you weren't required to learn. So you might get a few that are like, I have no idea what the heck that is. It must be something that we don't need to know. Mm -hmm. um, so that might get a little bit irritating. Um, but the the ones that I'm asking you to know are the really super major ones. So hopefully you won't run into too many of those like weird little muscles um, that I didn't ask you to memorize. So it should still be um, quite useful to use this self-assessment slash practice exam feature in the uh, Wiley Plus Real Anatomy Dissection Guy. You can go outside if you want and be with your husband. I'll probably. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's fine. He came back in. He's watching TV now. Okay. <laughs> he was just like, like gesticulating through the window. I was like, what are you trying to tell me? I don't understand. It's raining. He was doing this. <laughs> you like spiders? Yeah. Like, are you like doing the creep? What are you doing? <laughs> All right. <laughs> What what else? What else? Okay. Um. Well, whatever. I mean, I can I can review through everything again. Okay. Yeah. Through the um. Well, this video will be super helpful to everybody. I think so. Thank you for that. Yeah, um. But yeah, I just wanna. I really wanna emphasize to use this guy to study the um. Obviously, the coloring book, um, is going to be. I think a really good. <laughs> place to start and then once you feel kind of comfortable with the coloring book stuff maybe make some copies of it see how much you can identify uh, once you get a little bit more comfortable with where everything is at generally then like start on this guy and try start trying to see what they look like um, on like a real cadaver because um, that's why you do dissections in anatomy class because it never looks like a drawing it never looks like a picture right it always looks really weird and creepy so Perfect. That's the way I would recommend it. Yeah. So I'll ask more on Thursday. Okay. I will be here. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Have a good one, DJ. You as well. Bye.